Yeah, yeah. it's trouble. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. and that the doesn't recording look like started. Will. Yes, I don't know. The recording has started anyway, so maybe we better not say too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it says Will, and that doesn't look. No, like I think it's Natanya. Natanya is uh, also um, having me today. Um, so I would like to firstly start with a acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Committee of Rotarians Against Malaria acknowledges the First Nations of country throughout Australia and throughout the world and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. So our first speaker is um, past Rotary International President Ian Risley, who will be opening the conference. So past Rotary International President Ian Risley was born and raised in Melbourne and qualified as a chartered accountant with a master's degree in income tax law and has graduate diplomas in both accounting and income tax. Ian is a charter member of the Rotary Club of Sandringham and was district governor of District 9810 in the 1999-2000 Rotary year. In 1997, he led a group study exchange team to Massachusetts. Ian was co-chair of the 2016 Seoul Rotary Con Convention Committee and has been a director and treasurer of Rotary International. He became the president of Rotary International in the 2017 to 2018 Rotary year. Please welcome past Rotary International president Ian as he opens our virtual conference. Uh, thank you, Nat, very much, and thank you, everyone, for the invitation to be involved at the, the opening of this uh, virtual conference. And I do congratulate Ram on embracing technology in these difficult times to ensure such an important event takes place. It's wonderful to be a Victorian because you've actually got all the sympathy from every other state, which is uh, somewhat unusual. Most of the speakers you'll have at this conference, uh, like Professor Maxine, who's coming up shortly, they'll be talking from a, a scientific or a, a technical perspective. As Nat mentioned, I'm an accountant, so I can absolutely assure you that my short opening remarks are, are neither scientific nor, nor technical. Rotary has a, a long history in supporting actual um, activities uh, in favor of uh, human health, uh, going way, way, way back to almost the start of Rotary. Of course, our best known project uh, is against polio, but Rotarians Against Malaria is a good example of us in Rotary being able to do good work in, in more than one area at one time. Back when I was district governor, I guess it was last century, thanks for pointing that out, uh, Nat, RAM was relatively new and I remember Jackie Gleason in my district working hard to bring uh, RAM to the attention of Rotarians in my district, 9810, and talking about bed nets in the, the Solomon Islands. Now, clearly RAM has increased activities uh, significantly since then. I do congratulate Rotarians Against Malaria on the mutually beneficial relationship that you have with Rorks as an approved multi-district program supported by all Australian districts. Really important and it helps you a lot. It's also impressive to note the involvement that RAM has with, with rotor actors. Uh, RAM is the national project of rotor actors in Australia and you're utilizing the enthusiasm and skills of rotor actors at this conference as evidenced by, uh, by having Nat as your MC this morning. My father was, was based in, in Darwin during World War II. And I remember him telling me about his army mates who, who suffered from, from malaria, uh, about which when I was very young, I knew nothing, but uh, obviously it was an extremely serious issue. And thanks to the, the medical diligence we have, the rare cases of malaria we see in Australia now are, are all contracted from outside the country. But if we look at a map of the areas of the world where malaria is still a significant problem, it's mostly 
equatorial countries, including those very close to Australia. And when I was in Timor-Leste in 2001, the local medical fraternity there saw malaria as a definite threat to the community of Timor-Leste. And that threat continues and will do so until malaria is brought under control throughout the world. So the work of RAM is very, very important. I congratulate you on it and thank you for your endeavours. And may I wish you a very successful conference uh, coming up. Thank you for being with me. So thank you to Pass Rotary International President Ian Risley. And our first speaker of the day is Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Ken Lilly. Lieutenant Colonel Ken, Dr. Ken Lilly is in his 43rd year in the Army, working as a scientific officer at the Australian Defence Force Malaria and Infectious Disease Institute. He has been deployed on active service to Timor Lesi for, six, for two six month deployments and two tours of Iraq as a biological weapons inspector, chasing Saddam around. Lieutenant Colonel Lilly has been consulting for the World Health Organization and other scientific organizations for over 20 years, including being the lead facilitator of the Malaria Competence Course. His topic today is the WHO External Competence Assessment of Malaria Microscopics, ECAM course, its background, structure, records, status, and challenges. Please welcome Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Ken Lilly. Thanks, Nat. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today, and thank you for inviting me. I'm just going to share my screen so I can start my presentation. Okay, yes, as Nat said, uh, I'm going to speak on the World Health Organization's External Competence Assessment of Malaria Microscopus, or ECAM course, in my capacity as the lead facilitator of that course. Firstly, let me uh, set the scene. So far, so good. How many people have you got on so far? I can't. No. That's all right. Okay. It provides uh, for about uh, 70 to 80% of cases in the region. We've had successes in terms of vector control, we've had very high coverages of mosquito nets, we've had uh, uh, successes in rolling out the new treatment for the problem, we've had successes in uh, rolling out the new testing program. So uh, what we've done is we've succeeded in many, many ways in, uh, in the reduction of malaria incidence of local disease last uh, decade, and that has been uh, noted locally, but uh, because of uh, problems that we have in terms of accessibility, we still do have major problems. But that those increases are probably not due to uh, increasing malaria cases. We suspect that it could be due to uh, increase in diagnosis, I believe we can get malaria. It's, we do have the strategies, we do have the know, we do have the uh, drugs, we do have the tests, we do have everything. I, it is not impossible. We can receive malaria. Okay, some very positive words there from Leo Makita, the head of the Malaria Control Program in PNG. 
Uh, I've been working with Leo since the late 80s, in fact, and I remember back in those days, he was a very competent malaria microscopist. As Leo said, PNG accounts for over 80% of the morbidity and mortality within our region of the Western Pacific Regional Office of uh, WHO. According to the World Malaria Report in 2019, in the previous year, there were 228 million cases of malaria worldwide with over 400,000 deaths. So being able to diagnose malaria accurately in a timely manner is vitally important, especially in the management of new cases in the elimination setting, such as in PNG, which is uh, pushing for elimination in 2030. There's certainly an important role for the molecular methods in the diagnosis of malaria, as well as malaria microscopy. So for example, here we can see a rapid diagnostic test or RDT being used in the top of your screen. And below that, you can see that an example of nucleic acid testing, in this case, the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And the reality is today and into the future, these molecular methods are and will be used with malaria microscopy in the diagnosis of malaria. There are many advantages of malaria microscopy. We can physically look at the parasite. When we look down the microscope, it's definitive. We can see the parasite. We're not looking for a flashing light or an electrophoretic band or something indirect. It's direct. It's relatively inexpensive to perform. And of course, we can differenti differentiate, identify the stages of the parasite, the different species. Uh, the gametocytes, are the sexual forms present? We can look at drug effects and other morphological features in the blood film. And of course, we can get an idea of the true parasite load of malaria by counting the malarial parasites. So in this photomicrograph, you can see Plasmodium vivax. This is probably the most common parasite, certainly in our region. And what you're looking at here in the background are all of the red blood cells in this thin blood film. We've got a couple of platelets here. Up the top here, we can just see the edge of a white blood cell or neutroph and neutrophil. So these are our two mature trophozoites of plasmodium vivax. And you can see that the red cell is really very enlarged. It has a pleomorphic irregular shape, as does the nuclear, the parasite within the red blood cell. So here we see the blue cytoplasm of that irregular pleomorphic parasite. The nucleus of the parasite is large, red, and if you could focus up and down, it would be blinking at you like a traffic light, refractile. And in the, me in the membrane here of the red cells, we can see Schupner's dots. So all of these attributes together help us to identify that as Plasmodium vivax. I remember last year uh, showing a similar slide to some generals that came to visit us at work. And I was explaining how this vibrant, beautiful parasite with this irregular cytoplasm was so striking, particularly the Schupner's dots, which sort of bounced out at you. And I glanced around and looked at him and the others and realized that sometimes uh, in science, it's as much an art as a, sci as a science and not everyone gets quite as excited about morphology as, as I was that particular day. In this slide, we're looking at Plasmodium falciparum. So PF malaria, this is the killer. Every one minute, a child dies from malaria. And most of those children are dying from falciparum malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. So again, we can see the red blood cells in the background here. But in this case, the red blood cells are not enlarged. And the parasites, in this case, little immature trophozoites, uh, ring forms. You can see that it looks a bit like an engagement or signet type ring. The nucleus is smaller than vivax with fine, scant cytoplasm. And over here, we have the sexual form. This is the PF gametocyte, in this case, a female gametocyte. Very striking, present, banana shape. So certainly, if that's present, that makes it much easier for us to identify that species. Plasmodium malariae is quite different. Again, you can see the red blood cell like PF is not enlarged. But in this case, you can see these large merozoites around the outside of the red blood cell. So these merozoites, 
when this particular red blood cell bursts, the merozoites are released and in invade neighboring red blood cells, and the cycle continues. In the center, we can see some really striking greeny brown pigment, the hemozoan or waste product of the uh, parasite metabolizing hemoglobin. In this case, the merozoites are arranged in a radial or daisy head formation. All of these little things, again, to the morphologist, are helping us to identify the particular species involved. So this one is Ovali, very much a West African parasite. And you can see that the red blood cell in this case is enlarged, but not quite as enlarged as in Vivax. It has an oval shape, hence the name. And at the ends here, you can see what these projections or fimbriation. Again, very distinctive for Ovali if it's present and it's not always present. Now the parasite in this case is compact, unlike Vivax, which was that large irregular pleomorphic cytoplasm. The nucleus is large, a bit like Vivax. In this case, we see James dots on the red blood cell membrane, but again, fairly similar to Schuffner's dots. So this can be a difficult parasite to differentiate from, from Vivax, particularly in the thick blood film. Okay, a little bit of background to the ECAM course. So in 2003, there were a couple of drug trials that had serious problems in some African countries. The results basically were all over the place. So at the time, the people who ran the trial sent five boxes to different groups around the world, all the so-called experts. And we received a box and had a look at it. We found out that many of the results were completely wrong, including not being reproducible from day to day with the same microscopist. So there was a big question mark over the competence of the microscopists involved. Also around the same time, in the late 90s, the rapid diagnostic tests were being deployed into the field. And one of the fathers of the early RDTs was Dr. David Bell with WHO. And I remember David saying to me, Ken, I want to compare my new IDT test with the best, most competent microscopist here in the Philippines. Who are they? And we really couldn't tell. We had some fundamental training and some testing, but we really didn't know the true competence of the microscopist. So these things together was the genesis of the ECAM model, the external competence assessment of malaria microscopist model. So I've literally written the QA manual for malaria microscopy since those days. But back then, there was really no standardized competence assessment at all. So this ECAM course has now been running successfully for about 17 years. We started initially in Wipro, the Western Pacific Regional Office of WHO, specifically in the Philippines. And we moved very quickly into the Southeast Asian or Asia region, specifically Cambodia and Thailand. And then a number of years later, we moved into the African region, uh, then into the Middle East or EMRO. And COVID allowing, we'll get back into PAHO, Pan America, specifically Mexico, uh, next year. And increase the course in that particular region. So a little bit about the structure of the course. When we first started, we really thought we needed two weeks to give it justice. So we had a lot of training and competence assessment, but it came really clear that we were doubling up on the training effort. So we decided to make it really primarily about competence assessment. So we cut it back to five days. And also the feedback was really clear to us as well that many microscopists could not leave the bench for two weeks at a, at, at a time. There was just too much malaria around at that time. So the course is limited to five days. It's a very comprehensive full day. And we limit the number of participants to 12. These are, in theory, the 12 best microscopists in that particular country. That allows good communication, but also most countries struggle to get 12 or 13 uh, similar microscopists, uh, sorry, microscopes with all the equipment and consumables required to run the course. So I stress that this particular course is not training. Its goal is to assess the competence of the microscopist, but it would be a missed opportunity not to take that time to have some focus review or revision with those 12 top microscopists so they can, so we know they're all on the same page. Starting on the first day of the course, we have a pre-ECAM theory test. The results for this do not, not count towards their competence levels, 
it's really to give us a baseline and to find out how much training they're getting exposure to. And the reality is then and today, most microscopists are not getting access to adequate refresher training. For the same reason, we do a pre ecam practical test on day one to get their baseline practical knowledge, where we assess their ability to detect, identify and count malaria parasites. Throughout the week, there are a number of presentations on different aspects of malaria diagnosis, but we don't go into the wet areas. We don't take blood or make blood films, or prepare slides, etc. That's all vitally important, but we allow the, that to be covered in the training sessions. Starting on the second day, they look at 56 test slides over the next three days. Now these test slides could be any of the four human malaria species, including mixed infections and different counts, high, low, medium, and a lot of negative slides as well. All of these slides come from the WHO slide bank in the Philippines. They've all been PCR confirmed, and we get the true count from the results of 12 level one validators. Only level one and two are WHO certified. Level three and level four achieve a certificate of participation. All of those certificates last three years. So I tend to go back into the same country two or three years later to reassess those microscopists. So here are the competence levels. When the course first started, we had different terminology. We would expert, reference, advance, use all these different uh, subjective terms. But really, they mean different things in different countries. And to remove the subjectivity, we just refer to levels now, with level one from the highest down to level four. You can see that the microscopists are assessed on their ability to detect a parasite. So if they find a parasite on that, on that slide in the 10 minutes they have, they receive a mark, even if they get the species wrong. If the species is correct, they'll get a mark. If they correctly identify a negative slide or a mixed infection or a mono infection, again, a mark for species ID. They're assessed on their ability to count malaria parasites and they have to be, their count needs to be within 25% of the true count. So in order to achieve the, the particular levels, they have to satisfy all three parameters. For example, a microscopist may detect 95% of the parasites correctly. They may get 92% for species identification, but they may only get say 32% for parasite counting. So overall, they would achieve level three. Now these levels are utilized within the malaria programs according to their policy, but WHO and me via my reports make some recommendations. For example, level one and level two should be conducting the training within the country, controlling the QA and all the other elements of, of QA. Level three and four should really uh, be working with their results cross-checked by the high levels. And I certainly wouldn't want a level four microscopist um, reading, reading patient slides without their results being checked. So the course uh, records over the years have been very successful. The course started with just me for the first decade or so, and then it was seeded into the African countries. And there are now six facilitators there running Lusophone, Francophone, and Anglophone courses. And just in the last four years, uh, another four facilitators have joined me looking after the non-Afro regions. So I've conducted 144 of these ECAM courses in 24 countries with a major focus in our region. For example, last year in PNG, I was there for four different courses. That's obviously a major focus, as many of you know. So my role as the ECAM lead facilitator, as, as well as doing the courses, is to train and QA the other facilitators, at least annually. So the success has been very, the, sorry, the, the course has been even more successful than what we hoped when we started. There have been a, a number of published papers about its success and uh, the country programs are very much asking for the course on a regular basis. In, it's in great demand. So what is the current status of the ECAM course in this COVID-19 environment? We decided to extend the level one and level two certification for one year to allow the microscopists to 
continue to do their work within the QA programs of their countries. And also, if they are facilitators, to conduct ECAM courses in their own countries. Normally that wouldn't be allowed. It's meant to be external, uh, someone from another country assessing their country, but we're allowing them to do their own countries under my supervision during this period. We've started doing telecourses like we're doing today a little bit. Uh, another time I'd, I could talk about the worldwide e-learning course on malaria microscopy. This is a USB based 40 hour course that I've, I've helped to develop. So we're doing that uh, virtually at the moment. And I'm also planning to do a, a virtual ECAM course in, in PNG in November, if, if the internet is strong enough. We really don't know that part yet. Uh, the welcome training course was, was held in Sudan in August and that went very well. And there are plans to do that in India, Indonesia and Bangladesh and also Malaysia later this year. So how could RAM be involved in the ECAM course? It could be involved singly, uh, in concert with WHO, or even with um, the institute where I work, the Australian Defence Force of Malaria and Infectious Disease Institute. Thank you. Okay, that was definitely really interesting and a lot of things that I haven't heard of before so I found that really useful. Um, just a reminder for everyone that you can type any questions in a chat function and we will go through those at the end of each speaker. Um, so at the moment there doesn't seem to be any questions at the moment. Um, just a lot of compliments thanking you for your time Ken. Um, so I would like to thank you for your time today and introduce Professor Maxine Whitaker. So Professor Maxine Whitaker is the Dean of the College of Public Health, Medical and Veterinary Sciences and co-director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Vector-Borne and Neglected Tropical Diseases at James Cook University. Professor Whitaker's major academic foci are animal and human health systems and medical anthropology with a keen focus on equity and community ownership and engagement. She has worked in global health for more than 30 years and has been a technical advisor to RAM Australia since 2019. In 2017, she was awarded the Royal Australasian College of Physicians International Medical Medal in recognition of outstanding service in developing countries. Her topic today is intersectoral collaboration for malaria elimination. What is it and what are the benefits? Please welcome Professor Maxine Whitaker. Thank you everybody and um, it's my pleasure to be here again this year. Um, this is on my calendar every year to attend if I can. So thank you for inviting me. Um, and I do at the moment, uh, before I start, wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting. Uh, I'm on the Wulgarakapa and Bindal people's land uh, and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging leaders. So I'll just share my screen. So I'm going to, uh, I was asked to talk about intersectoral collaboration based on a, a few uh, pieces of work that I've been doing with some colleagues. So basically I'll, I'll run through um, talking about what is intersectoral collaboration, uh, what makes successful intercollaboration, intersectoral collaboration and what are the benefits. And I'll start here with this, um, uh, with this diagram that came from the Action and Investment to Defeat Malaria Report 2016 to 2030, which was developed as a companion piece to the Global Malaria Action Plan 2015, uh, 2016 to 2030. Uh, and most of you involved in even thinking about malaria have probably seen or read that report before. 
So this report, and I was um, engaged in being a consultant with it as well as uh, a writer, uh, noted that strong multi-sectoral and inter-country partnerships are essential to achieve the 2030 malaria goals, which includes in our Asia Pacific region, the elimination of malaria by 2030, and that non-health sectors are critical to break that vicious cycle of malaria, of low productivity and poverty. So today I'm going to explore this theme through, as I said, some of the work in which I've been engaged. So what is uh, multi-sectoral or intersectoral collaboration? In 1997, this concept of intersectoral action for health was promoted by WHO, and they defined it as a recognised relationship between the health sector and at least another sector to take action on an issue to achieve health outcomes to be more effective, efficient or sustainable. And it further emphasised that this collaboration has to be a managed process, not just a conceptual one. So not just something to talk about, but something to do. In 1998, the World Health uh, organization's health promotion glossary defined intersectoral collaboration as cooperation between different sectors of society, such as the public sector and all aspects of that public sector, civil society, including NGOs and civil society organizations like RAM, and the private sector. So why are we paying so much attention to this and, and spending time in, in other documents talking about this? Well, as noted in that opening slide, we believe that there are many benefits in doing intersectoral collaboration. One is that synergy of efforts. I'll describe a bit more of this in some later slides, but the concept, for example, of integrated vector management, where the efforts taken to manage the vectors that uh, spread malaria can also be part of a program to address other vector-borne infections is probably one of a, a very good example of how to do synergistic efforts. And I'll show you a few more examples when we get to the sustainable development goals. It allows some new funding and resourcing opportunities to be made available to the malaria program. For example, uh, in the AIM report, we talked about how Benin in 2011 was able to access World Bank funding for the malaria program, not as a health program, but as a joint submission with the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Health, because it showed the positive impact upon the gross domestic product of Benin by having efforts in malaria. So many partnerships that we talked about in AIM discussed how resources available like logistics, accessibility to populations, use of private sector clinics and labs, etc., can support the malaria efforts. There's cost effectiveness and efficiency by leveraging service delivery, logistical support, lab support for more than one disease or across sectors like animal and human health sectors. That means that the total cost of the malaria program is less than having a standalone program. And that there are other health benefits that can be attained by those investments. So making the whole of the health sector a more effective and efficient set of programs. However, a caution, this requires careful planning of the systems to make sure that the quality and coverage required is maintained, that you don't overload the workforce that's involved in delivering those services. Uh, and that because we're looking at a malaria elimination agenda, that we still will be able to eliminate, have that focused effort, even whilst we may be having some more integrated services. In this COVID world in which we're now in and are probably in for the next three years from a, a, a impact point of view, health programs will need to be more efficient because they'll have lower levels of funding at global, national and private sector levels because of the economic impacts. And so we do need to look at how to still keep our eye on the malaria control and elimination agenda whilst we are struggling with reduced budgetary allocations. This leveraging on other programs and services also supports the ease of access and can uh, to delivering services to remote places or to remote populations. And at the moment, I'm involved in work with the World Health Organization to look at reaching unreached populations and looking at leveraging on existing 
uh, health programs that are already going there, but maybe don't take malaria programs, or looking at other sectors that are reaching those populations that we could actually work with, is actually a key strategy to reaching the unreached and also universal health care. It may be that we're leveraging on food delivery, uh, that famous last mile of the Coca-Cola uh, logistics strategies, but also even looking at animal services. And at a community level, the community sees health and health needs related holistically, not to silos of say maternal health, child health, malaria, diabetes, but they see it as their health program. The opportunities costs of them having to go to siloed services often reduces their utilization of them, as well as frustrates them and may even reduce their trust in a service that can't meet their other health needs. And this diagram out of uh, the AIM program, again, you'll just see some of those various sectors that we're talking about and a summary of some of those um, some of those aspects that I've just mentioned. And you'll see this quote here, and I really wanted to put a focus on that last part, that working together with diverse partners creates advantageous synergies, whereby the whole becomes far greater than the sum of the individual partners and individual parts. And I think that's a very important thing for us to think about, not only for a malaria free world, but in that aim to try to have universal health care for all globally, as well as reaching the sustainable development goals. This next slide, which I know is very busy and definitely not readable, um, but I do recommend you uh, go to the Action and Investment for Malaria to Defeat Malaria um, online. I'll give you the, in the reference uh, list, there's the link to it. But I just wanted to show three examples. So the first example here would be poverty. And that's goal one of the Sustainable Development Goals. We know that sustained investment in health and malaria, as it says on this slide, unlocks the potential of human capital to generate growth. We know that a 10% reduction in malaria has been associated with a 0.3% rise in annual GDP. And at a household level, we know that reducing malaria protects household income from lost earnings and costs of seeking care. We also know that poverty, on the other hand, may mean that people live in malarious areas, may not be able to afford protection, may not be able to seek care. So these synergies are in both directions. Just quickly, two other examples. Goal number two is zero hunger. We know that sustainable agricultural practices can help reduce malaria. There's a lot of examples of that, particularly with integrated vector management. People who suffer less from malaria, we also know can work their fields more consistently and therefore better harvest and can improve food security. We also know that well-nourished children can improve their education capacity as well as their ability to fight malaria. And in education, goal number four, as I mentioned, reducing malaria enables children to attend school regularly, learn more effectively, and that includes it improves their wage earning capacity in the long term. But we also know that a woman, a mother's or caregiver's level of education, as it increases, the chances of their, them being able to implement strategies to prevent and treat malaria improves, and therefore better survival of infants and children. This is that integrated vector management that I mentioned a bit earlier, and they've got a definition there about it being rational decision making process for the optimal use of resources for vector control. So IVM plans to uh, aims to deliver, plan, monitor and evaluate interventions that use a combination of vector control measures. And these can include usually environmental management or some other other sectors activities, not just those activities in the health sector. So it can be effective and efficient in also controlling other vector-borne diseases at the same time. But as I've bolded there, a key element of this is that collaboration between sectors uh, inter, uh, within the health, uh, so different programs, as well as with non-health sectors. And this next slide, and again, it's, it's a, a cut out of AIM, and it is busy. It only represents at the moment this matrix four, uh, two of the four areas of determinants of malaria. So the four are 
society and environment, as I've shown you there, but also population level and household level. And across the top, you can see that broad ranging number of potential sectoral matches, including foreign affairs, finance, food and agriculture, education, infrastructure, transport, water and sanitation and security. So I won't go into detail on this, but you can get a feeling for that intersectoral collaboration by looking at this. And as it says, there are win-win situations here for us to look at. And we know that to eliminate malaria, we must have this intersectoral collaboration to get that last case. So how do we do intersectoral collaboration? In summary, these are the six main areas to look at. And for example, we know that having functional regulatory bodies, coherent policies and good community engagement are essential elements in ensuring intersectoral action for malaria control and elimination. Decisions, for example, on where to have major construction schemes need to account for changes in vector habitats and therefore any health consequences of those changes. In India, they have civic bylaws that act as an entry point to ensure compliance um, by major construction programs in cities where there is urban malaria, that they must ensure that they clear the site and don't have potential breeding locations, ponds of water, etc., lying around their construction site. If they don't, the incentive or perhaps disincentive is that if they don't do that, they will not get uh, the right to um, the issue of occupancy certificate to allow them to even use that building. So again, looking at those incentive structures are important. And leadership and partnership with good communications are critical for all of that. And I'll go to, into these in a little bit more detail. But first, um, colleagues and I have worked on two systematic reviews that were funded by the Tropical Disease Research part of the World Health Organization. One of them looked at the importance of intersectoral action to reduce vector-borne diseases, including malaria. And I'll go into that one in more detail. But the second one also looked at how you can use intersectoral actions to reach mobile and migrant populations who are often the unreached populations in many countries. And for malaria, particularly in parts of Southeast Asia, it's the forest dwellers, it's the people who move um, into farming areas in malarious areas from other areas in season for seasonal um, farming, etc., who are some of the people who still have malaria and don't have access to services. You can see here um, that we've we tried to summarize from the literature uh, that we reviewed the strategic roles of intersectoral collaboration around preventing and minimizing risk, early diagnosis and treatment, commitment, monitoring and evaluation. And under those, the types of activities that we found sectors, other sectors had been successfully engaged in. You can see the sectors both within the government so not just health, but education, military, immigration, et cetera, as well as non-government bodies that have, have been shown to be successfully involved in intersectoral collaboration. And then the roles they played and the contribution those roles had across a broad range from technical assistance and capacity building, leadership coordination, resourcing, not just financing, but also people, data, policies, uh, and also access to groups like those mobile and migrant populations. We also summarized what were the factors that influenced success in those areas. And that was everything uh, I've highlighted the top from a percentage wise, the top five, there's more than five stars there because some of them all share the same percentage. But there are important elements in having um, a clear agreement on the outcomes uh, as part of a shared vision. Very important in the relationships. You can see consistent commitment, and consistent and regular communication are important. The approach you take is highly important. And that's where I would stress looking at the literature to see what are other successful intersectoral collaborations. It includes participation, empowered communities, using pre-existing organizations that are successful and trusted in, the, in those areas. And also particularly around the role of schools and school teachers. And I know RAM has done a lot of work in this area as well. 
and then the areas around uh, resourcing, particularly technical and financial support from tech other international agencies. But there are also barriers to success and the top five are shown there. You do need political will and you do need to find a common ground. Political differences makes it hard. Uh, the reverse of good communication, if there's poor communication, poor coordination, intersectoral collaboration does not work. There may be financial constraints and often encouraging people to see uh, and funders to see that they should resource intersectoral collaboration is important. It's an important lesson that has been learnt from the COVID-19 situation in the Western Pacific region that donors and, and government uh, are funding uh, malaria programs to deliver other COVID activities and we're hoping that they will sustain that ability to fund and allowing that ability to fund um, intersectoral activities beyond a COVID response is a lesson they've learnt and a lesson that they will continue. You need real lack of, uh, you, the lack of local commitment is a big barrier and again that's where groups like civil societies can play a major advocacy and support role and insufficient and irregular supply. So if still you can't get the, the things you need to have a successful malaria program, no matter how much you've got intersectoral collaboration, it won't work. Just so to sum up, I thought I'd just look at what it is um, from those success factors and that bigger diagram that RAM does or can continue to do or contemplate. The leadership role is obvious and maintaining that leadership role, not only at local levels, but also at that global level. Playing an advocacy role and again, supporting advocacy efforts in other countries and other settings. Being a social mobiliser, which we have a lot of support for. And then you can see the others there around working with multi-sectoral partners, having other aspects of Rotary contributing across its various platforms and members capacities, is a funder, an implementation partner, and has coalitions we can draw upon. Thank you very much. That's a video conference. Yeah, you can access it. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Maxine. So we do have a couple of questions. And if anyone wants to ask um, Maxine a question, if you could type it in the chat and then we will get to those. Um, and then we'll go back to Ken as well to answer a couple of questions that were popped in the group. Sure. Um, so I see a question there from Richard, wouldn't local commitment not be a significant requirement? So um, we were using the literature that exists. So one of the things, and I suppose this is um, also a message I have to any of you that are involved in, in intersectoral collaboration or, or doing activities, is when you do systematic reviews, you can only A, use what's in the literature, and B, rely upon things that have got a good, strong monitoring and evaluation framework. So although for both of those systematic reviews, we had more than 200 papers that looked like we could use them, when we actually looked at the robustness of the evidence and see if they even talked about intersectoral collaboration in more detail, we could only in both ones use about 15 to 19 papers. So what I was doing was showing you what the research evidence shows from a systematic review. But if you remember that barriers to um, the barriers to intersectoral collaboration being successful, not having local commitment was there. So again, it's it's we're looking at what was in the literature. I do agree, local commitment is is absolutely essential, and from my from my experience, it is very important. Uh, and and I've talked in the past at RAM about community engagement and participation. Um, I can't see any, I know there's a couple of questions in there for, um, uh, for Ken as well. Um, hang, hang on, uh, Maxine, uh, this is yep. Will. Um, yep. I just noticed a question from Don Mercer. Yep. Uh, and he says, interesting, there's much learning on mm -hmm. health program in the sectoral collaboration. I understand that the lessons on tracing for polio, et cetera, in developing countries are now used for COVID-19. I don't know if that is just a, uh, a comment or a, uh, a question. Uh, maybe you can elaborate on it. 
Yeah, I mean, at the moment, there's a lot. I think I must go to nearly every second day um, uh, a webinar or a meeting like this in the in WHO or in neighbouring countries around how they are using lessons learnt from other programs, be it malaria, neglected tropical diseases, polio, um, or lessons from community participation in surveillance and response for Ebola. There's a lot of joint learning happening right now. Uh, and that's fantastic because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The problem, um, that I've seen from my experience over you know, 30 plus years, as, as um, was mentioned by Nat, is that often we do that response when there's a crisis. We forget to embed that learning and those approaches into normal business. We don't readjust how we do things after the crisis. And that's really unfortunate, even something that was discussed yesterday afternoon, even within, say, World Health Organization or other international organizations, it might be people just down the corridor who have been doing successful, say, surveillance and response for something else. But when a new crisis comes, they didn't go and talk to them. I mean, even with the COVID pandemic, all of the lessons that we've learned about how to uh, communicate in crises to cross-cultural groups, to people with low education seem to have been forgotten in our responses until we had a crisis of those people being people who were unreached by messages and suffering from COVID-19. So our challenge is, um, is to make sure that we embed those changes we make now in response to a crisis into business as usual post-crisis. And, and, and that's something that I think is, is the message. But yes, we are being more effective by using some of those existing uh, strategies and some funders are freeing up their restrictions on use of fridges or logistics or data to allow that to happen. But really, and as I said early on, in the economic difficulties we're going to face for health programs for, for, for many years to come, at least in the next three years, we, it makes sense to sustain those because that's the way we're going to actually be effective and efficient and using the resources to provide not just malaria programs or polio programs, but health programs to a broader number of people. Um, there's also a question here about um, any intersectoral collaboration models piloted in the Asia Pacific region that we can apply. Uh, yeah, uh, again, in the systematic review, um, that they're what we looked at. So um, I've given you in the slide set the reference to those papers. Uh, WHO and others do do case studies around that. And again, I'm happy to provide um, some information about those. Again, um, often people, as I said, often people write about them as stories. But when you want to look at the evidence to say, so how did they really do it? What worked? What didn't work? Um, what were the lessons learnt? And particularly, not just an outcome about, um, about say, the increased coverage of bed nets or uh, the increased coverage of, of lab testing, but has it sustained beyond that pilot or beyond that funded project? Um, that's often what isn't in the literature. And that's what, in both papers, we argued people need to start thinking about trying to look at what are the lessons learnt and the successes of the collaboration itself, not just the outcomes of that collaboration, because otherwise we'll keep making mistakes around how to do intersectoral collaboration. Okay, that's, that's, that's pretty good, Maxine. Thank you so much for Pleasure. explaining it in layman's terms. <laughs> uh, some, some of us are all uh, very keen in helping out in the, with with malaria and what have you. Um, and I think that uh, although the technical uh, aspect is very, very much an essential thing, sometimes when people uh, are uh, getting involved into this, they need to know the very basics as well. And uh, your explanation was very well done indeed. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And My it's pleasure. always great to see you. Thank um, you. Uh, Nat, uh, I'll throw back to you because uh, you had some uh, questions still for Dr. Ken Lilly. Yeah, so um, we'll jump back to Ken. So I had a couple of questions um, about how many countries have model pool varieties of malaria? 
Yeah, so um, as microscopists, one, one of the things that we don't do very well is pick up mixed infections, but the molecular methods certainly pick up uh, more mixed infections. Um, I mean, many countries have, have different uh, combinations of species. Some uh, are very limited and just with PF and PV, like most in our region. But interestingly enough, PNG has all four human species. So I QA their slides every month and I'm looking at ovale and malaria uh, quite a lot, which is, which is quite amazing from, from our perspective. But uh, yeah, it, dep it depends on the country as far as what species they have. Um, and the other one is, why is microscopy preferred to RDTs in Indonesia? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, when we talk about microscopy, I like to say there's microscopy versus quality assured microscopy. And from I've, I've done quite a few courses in Indonesia and they've got a very good system of having quality assured microscopy. So I believe that uh, because it's much cheaper, they tend to use microscopy a, a lot. Um, someone that knows more about it than I do, uh, leading on to Professor Dennis Shanks maybe, <laughs> Um, there may be something about the antigenic expression that makes the RDTs less efficacious in Indonesia. I don't really know, to be honest, about that. But I do know that the microscopy there has done very well, unlike a lot of other countries, and they tend to rely on it a lot for that reason. Um, and the last question we have from Libby is, do the species crossbreed? Uh, where is that question? Was that the one about the different... Can have someone have four different species? Is that the one? Uh, it was just sent in just then, so that's at the bottom of the list. Okay, before I get to that one, someone was asking about can someone have several you know, different species? So I mentioned the mixed infection. So that's obviously where the patient has more than one species at the same time. So for example, in a country like PNG, where there's maybe 50, 50, 60, 40 PF and PV, uh, you are going to see uh, a lot of mixed infections with those two species. When I was in Timor-Leste during, during the fighting, we had a Jordanian soldier with PF, PV and PM, all PCR confirmed. And I read a paper only about a month ago about uh, another patient that had all four species. So it is possible, but not, not particularly common. I'll just move down to that last question so I can read exactly what it says. Do, 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 do species crossbreed? No, they don't. That's the definition of a species, of course, the fact that they can't uh, interbreed. Fabulous. So um, thank you to Ken for jumping back in and also for Professor Maxine for sharing um, a very interesting talk on intersectoral collaboration. I'd now like to introduce Professor Dennis Shanks. Um, Dennis has been the director of the Australian Defence Force Malaria and Infectious Disease Institute in Brisbane for the past 13 years and is an adjunct professor at the University of Queensland School of Public Health as well as at James Cook University. For the past, for the previous 20 years, Professor Shanks has been a US Army medical officer who spent most of his military career conducting field trials of new anti-malarial drugs in the tropics. Professor Shanks did the first trial of tofenacaine, a new anti-malarial drug, which has just been registered in Australia and the USA and has published over 200 research papers on malaria and other infectious diseases. His topic today is the use of tofenacaine for Vivax malaria relapse prevention in the Asia Pacific. Please welcome Professor Dennis Shanks. Thank you and good morning. I trust you can all hear me. I'm uh, pleased to once again uh, be uh, on the RAM list of speakers. Um, even as we all know in this COVID era, it's a little bit different. Uh, let me uh, share my screen and see if we can uh, bring up uh, my uh, presentation here. Now, I'm seeing it, uh, uh, hopefully you are too. But as was indicated in the introduction, I'm the director of the Australian Defense Force Malaria and Infectious Disease Institute, uh, K 
Ken Lilly and I work in the same place in Brisbane. And what I'd like to talk to you today is about an anti-malarial drug that I've been working on for some time called tofenaquin. Fortunately, it's no longer just a theoretical drug. It is a registered drug and it can be used in Australia, the United States and Vietnam even today. But what we're hoping to do with it eventually, and we're not there yet, eventually is use it for public health purposes to actually eliminate malaria. So what I'm going to talk about a bit today with this new drug that's based on an old drug is to try and tell you where we are to this point and hopefully where we'll eventually get to with it. Now, tofenaquin uh, is the new drug that we have since 2018 when it was registered by the Therapeutic Good uh, Administration, both for chemoprophylaxis or prevention and also for treatment of relapsing malaria. It has some problems. I'm going to talk about them. G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is a uh, genetic uh, uh, susceptibility, if you will, uh, defense mechanism to malaria and has complicated our life with this drug and I'll talk to you about it. But generally this is a well-tolerated drug that is used for malaria treatment and prophylaxis that we're still trying to develop as a public health tool. The reason we need it as a public health tool is that malaria parasites have been around for a very, very long time. We think of them generally as a parasite of the blood, and that's true. They are a parasite of the blood, and that's how we know about its symptoms, and that's how we see the disease malaria. But they also, at least for relapsing malaria, can hide in the liver and maintain themselves there for months and sometimes even a year or so. And these are called sleeping parasites or hypnozoites. And despite a lot of different efforts, there are only a few drugs that will actually kill these residual parasites in the person. And one of them is tofenaquin and its predecessor called primaquin. These are eight aminoquinolones, which is a class of drug, and they're imperfect drugs. They have problems, but they're the only ones we have right now that it can kill all the kinds of the parasites, get rid of it in the blood, in the mosquito, and potentially in the liver too. So that's why we're interested in them in their public health aspects and how we can try try to see how this might be applied to malaria elimination. First, where are we right now? Well, we're, we can use this today as a substitute for Primaquin, where we actually treat people who present with Vivax or, or Valley malaria. We know that these people are at a very high chance of having another attack of malaria in the next several months. That's why it's known as relapsing. So if you give them a blood treatment, typically chloroquine, as well as tofenaquin, you can stop them from relapsing. And that's why we want to do it. Most importantly, with tofenaquin, you can give this as a single 300 milligram dose. And that's its real advantage over the older drug, primaquin. You can do it in a single dose. So whereas before we had to give it over two weeks of medication, now we can give it as a single dose with a blood drug to kill the parasites in the blood, but also get rid of them from the liver so that they don't relapse. Now, this is an advantage, but it's only a step increase. What I'm going to try and explain as we go on is why this step increase may be important to public health. But we can use this right now for treatment of relapsing malaria to prevent relapses. We can also use tofenaquin as a prevention drug. 
That is, you take it before you get sick, before you get bitten, to make sure that you don't get sick. Now, this is obviously the military and travel medicine aspect of this, where you take the drug for three days and 200 milligrams, and then you take it weekly. And if you take the drug while you're being bitten, you shouldn't get sick. These are the prevention studies that have been done in Africa by myself, by others in Asia, that have shown that this particular drug uh, shown with its brand name there, but they're all known as tofenaquin generally, that this is something that we can use in adults for prevention right now. We're moving on to treatment and prophylaxis in children, and those studies are being done and being completed now. So we hope to have a full spectrum of ages where we can use this drug for treatment of relapsing malaria and prevention of all kinds of malaria. We're still working on it. We're still looking at different aspects. You can give this up to six months and we're working on extending it out for an entire year. We can give it weekly and that's how it's given right now, but we're also looking at moving even to monthly dosing in some of our studies in Vietnam and other places where you would only have to take some of the drug once a month, and that would be a great advantage. Pediatric formulations are coming along. Un unfortunately, like most anti-malarial drugs, it tastes terrible. So you're okay if you can swallow a tablets, but not so good if we're trying suspensions or other things. And public health indications. That's where we're, we really have not yet achieved what we want to do. But we think that we may, in the future, be able to use this to actually eliminate uh, um, malaria transmission in areas. And that's the real interest that we have of this, that we share with RAM, WHO, and others of trying to see if there isn't a way to use drugs to eliminate malaria. Now, all drugs have adverse events. All drugs have problems. Tofenaquins are relatively similar to the old drug, primaquin, so that some people, if they take a dose on an empty stomach, do have some GI upset. As a practical matter, that's the major one that we deal with. But generally, if you take the medicine with food, it's reasonably well uh, tolerated. G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase has been the problem with the whole class of these drugs known as the eight aminoquinolones and to be honest we haven't solved that problem yet. I'll discuss it a bit more in just a moment. Because you see G6PD deficiency is really very common as you can see from some of these maps from the Malaria Atlas project. Where you find malaria, particularly relapsing malaria or vivax malaria, people have a genetic advantage if they have this particular human genetic polymorphism known as G6PD. So in Asia, it's really very common. And that's good. It protects you from some aspects of malaria. The downside of it, if you're a person like me who gives anti-malarial drugs for a living, is that if you do it under the wrong circumstances, you can get hemolysis, which is where the red cells in your blood actually break open if you give too much of, of these types of eight aminoquinoline drugs, such as primaquin or tofenaquin, to someone who has this particular genetic polymorphism known as G6PD. Now we can work around this. There are blood tests that once you do them, you can determine if people have this particular genetic trait. And if they do, you don't give them the drug. Now that sounds simple, but in reality, trying to make that actually happen can be very complicated. In the military, we screen through people we're dealing with one to 2% of our soldier population that are G6PD positive. 
and we just label them such that they don't get this particular drug. But if you're in a situation in a malaria endemic area, say Papua New Guinea, and five to 10% of the population has it, and you don't have easy access to a blood testing machine like you see in the picture, you can quickly see how this can become a lot more difficult. So we, we, it, it is a well-tolerated drug with that particular condition placed on it that at least at this juncture, we should not be giving the, this drug to people with this particular genetic trait. If we do so, they can have a hemolytic reaction, which is something we really don't want to do. Is there a way around this? Well, testing is one, and that's what we're working on, but there are other ways that we think we might be able to address it. Because you see, it's a relative thing. You can give at least 100 milligrams to people who are even G6PD deficient. And we've done this in Thailand in women and, and other people. And we're looking at the possibility of testing it in other places, particularly men who uh, have this dis deficiency. Now, 100 milligrams isn't a full dose, but it it's at least suggestive that we could be able to use this in other circumstances. Right now, using the analogy of the old drug, Primaquin, you can use a low dose of Primaquin without testing anybody. And that's true in Africa, that's true in Papua New Guinea, that's true in any of a number of places. And we would like to get there with Tofenaquin, possibly, at a lower dose of 100 milligrams. We're not there yet. We can't do this, but yet. But we think we may be able to in the future. And that's where we're trying to get to, where we can confidently give this drug to people, either in a situation where we've tested them for this genetic polymorphism, or we're giving them a low enough dose that we don't have to worry about it. There have been some other issues that have come up with the Fenequin in the last year or so. We're in the process of registering this drug across Asia. And the, one of the big places we would of course be very interested in using it is our large neighbor to the north in Indonesia, which has a great deal of malaria, a lot of it relapsing or vivax malaria. Now, when you give this drug to Fenequin, you give it in combination with another drug to clear the parasites from the blood. That's when someone is already sick. And chloroquine is the main drug that we've tested. In Indonesia, they tend to use ACTs or artemisinine combination therapies. And we were surprised last year to learn when GSK announced that when they used it with this other common medication, it didn't work so well in terms of preventing relapses. We haven't yet figured out what this means, but this tells you that even after you get a drug registered and available for use, that doesn't mean you understand all that's happened and all that you need to do. So this is particularly an issue for Indonesia, and it's something that perhaps in, in later meetings I can come back to you on. Right, right now, I'm afraid all we can really say is it didn't work as well as we wanted to, and we're still working on trying to figure out what happened. What do we think happened? Well, again, we're not entirely sure, but it probably has something to do with drug metabolism. Drug metabolism is how the body handles a drug. It actually breaks it down, processes it, develops intermediates. It's something that pharmacologists and people like me are concerned about because your body, just like it digests food, it digests and changes drugs, and sometimes in particular ways. This is what we think, the picture there, happens to some of the molecules of the drug. They get changed and they get changed into active forms that conduct what we know call uh, reduction, reduction oxidation reactions. And we think that's probably what's actually killing the parasite. 
It takes the iron that's actually, it's mobilizing in the red blood cell, it reacts with it, and it kills the parasite that way. If we overdo it, we may break the red cell, and that's called hemolysis, and that's what we're trying to avoid. We're also trying to do this inside the liver or the hepatocyte, the liver cells, and make sure that we can kill the residual parasites that are left there without getting in trouble from other drug met metabolic issues. So where, where would all this uh, possibility, potential, and potential difficulties fit in terms of malaria elimination? Well, we've been trying to do filarial elimination by giving handfuls of simple anti-worm medications across the Pacific. And that's been very sp successful in many ways. And the question, the analogy we're trying to put forward is if we had a safe drug that we could give across a large population, could we, just like we're trying to get rid of the worms of filaria, get rid of the parasites of malaria? Could we stop epidemics? Could we eliminate it from entire islands such that we didn't have a malaria problem? Well, the answer is it's possible. It's, we say it's possible because in some places it's been done. And I would quote to you the example of an atium in Vanuatu because that's where Dr. Kaneko of JICA did it some years ago. Now he wasn't using tofenaquin because we didn't have it at that time, but he was using something similar called primaquin and other drugs. And when he gave multiple rounds of drugs over several weeks and different times, he was able to get rid of the malaria from this rather small island. And it did work. Uh, it was a lot of work, however. And so as a proof of principle, it's pretty good. As a uh, public health program that you could go to any other island in Melanesia, it's got some real challenges. But I quote it, even though it was some time in the past, because it does show in our area with drugs that we have had in the past, it is possible to do so. But it's not simple because you have to get the entire population to do it. Populations move around, boarding school students come back with malaria. It's not the simplest thing that's, that people have ever tried. But today, if you go to most parts of Vanuatu, and especially Southern Vanuatu, there's no malaria there. And that is quite an achievement uh, of Dr. Kaneko, his, and particularly other people at the Ministry of Health in Vanuatu. Now, could we use this principle and do it on other islands of Melanesia? And if you will, push malaria out? Well, in theory, yes. What would be the practical applications? Well, first, we're going to need bed nets. I know bed nets aren't medications, but none of us think that malaria is such a simple parasite that we're going to do this with any single intervention. We're talking about blocking transmission, stopping the next person from getting bitten by a mosquito and getting malaria. So Ram has been very interested and invested in using mosquito nets, and I don't want anything that I say to be taken as being against mosquito nets. Yes, they're needed, but yes, more than mosquito nets are needed. Sometimes that spray, we're, where we're working towards, we hope, is that someday in the future we'll have a relatively simple drug that we can enhance what bed nets already do. And whereas we can achieve control in some places with spray and bed nets, where we could actually move to elimination by pulsing a drug through a community. Where we've tried this, you can knock down transmission. Because once someone's taken a drug like tofenaquin, they will not pass the parasite on to the next mosquito. 
you have to get high levels of community participation. So what Maxine Whitaker was talking about with public health programs and local collaboration and uh, other things such as working within the community, that's terribly important. We're trying to see if it might be possible to even feed this or other drugs to the mosquitoes in different circumstances and to block the, the parasite in the mosquito. We're not there yet. We're still looking at things that have to be done. But I think we can say that one of the possibilities for future public health interventions include long-acting drugs such as tofenaquin to actually stop malaria transmission in places where we've achieved otherwise reasonable control using bed nets and other interventions. Where might this be done? Well, there have been different places discussed. On Lahir Island, they're already doing it within the current circumstances. And there's a big mine there, and that they, they appear to have gotten pretty good control. On islands such as Manus off of Papua New Guinea, they've controlled it before, and there's not a big malaria problem there currently. Would that be that, New Ireland, other possible islands through PNG, possibly even the Solomons? Uh, yes, those are the kinds of places that we would think about the possibility of actually doing a mass drug administration, that's what MDA stands for, mass drug administration, where you pulse a drug through a community and try not only to control it, but actually to eliminate it. Other islands have been suggested, Isabella, Pentecost, well, one can look and think about other dif different possibilities. We're not there yet, but an important step has been made by getting drugs registered, at least in Australia and the US, and we're hoping to include other countries in the, in the drug registration for tofenaquin very soon. So what do we need? Well, we need to figure out how to get around the G6PD issue. We're not there yet, but we're doing testing to try and find low doses that will work. We're extending out our safety studies, going out not just for single dose, but six months, even a year. And fortunately, other than G6PD, this does appear to be a very uh, safe drug. And proof of concept in other places, such as Dr. Kaneko did many years ago in an ATM, possibly on, on the cards for some future island in the future. So let me conclude by just saying that in the end, if we're going to eliminate malaria, we've got to kill all the residual parasites. That certainly includes the blood. It is certainly in, means stopping it in the mosquito but it also includes getting the residual parasites out of the liver, the sleeping parasites called the hypnozoites. We've got to find better ways to use this old class of drug, and we think tofenaquin may be it. And we've got to find better combinations, particularly with chloroquine, to find, see how we might be able to achieve this. Uh, I've been talking uh, but I obviously represent not only the military, but a, a large number of collaborators. And I don't want anyone to think that I, everything I've talked about, uh, I did myself, because I certainly didn't. I, I won't go into all our different collaborators, except to say that some of them are pictured there. And I will be happy to uh, uh, address any questions you might have, understanding that like any intervention, uh, we're, we're still in process of improving one that we do have available to us, but we need to learn how to use better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, I found that quite fascinating and interesting, especially around the deficiency um, and how this can be used to eliminate malaria. We do have quite a number of questions. Um, so can you see a depot injection eventually, perhaps monthly to three monthly offering? 
Uh, depot injections have been looked at for uh, some uh, things, and we are developing them with, uh, with other antimalarials, not this one. This is such a long-acting drug that we don't think we're going to need a depot injection. I mean, we think monthly is quite doable. And in places in Africa where we give it three monthly over transmission periods, uh, that may uh, be quite enough. On an island, which is a different geography, we think if you really pulse it through the population, that may work. So yes, we are looking at depot injections, but with different drugs, not to fenaquin. Fabulous. Um, is there any risk for resistance to primaquine and to fenaquine and the adoption for use of drugs by governments that can be slow due to red tapes, is this a problem for tifanocrine? Well, let me, uh, <laughs> let me talk about resistance. Uh, there's always drug resistance, and that's why we use it in combination, and that's why it's important to get it right. It's also important that governments do have a role in what drugs are used in their country. So uh, we are working through the registration process. We always start with difficult countries <laughs> like Australia or the United States, because that gives countries that don't have such sophisticated regulatory agencies the confidence that we're not hiding anything. You have to show all the data, all the problems, all the potential. And so this is a drug registered like we would for any drug. And we, we have to maintain high standards. We use it in Australians. Uh, we use it in Americans. We, you know, we don't just take it to developing poor countries and use it there. So yes, it's going to take us a while to get the registration packages through. It's in India, it's in Indonesia. They're looking at, I think they've managed Cambodia or will soon. So uh, that's, that's also a process that's gonna take us a while. Um, and should Caucasians contemplating use of tifenocrine as prophylaxis be tested for G6PD? Yes, uh, actually the people who have the highest, uh, I guess the most deficient G6PD are, are actually Greeks and Italians. And that goes back to where, the, where their ancestors lived around the Mediterranean Sea. So although it's not as common as places such as Central Africa or uh, Melanesia, uh, the people you can get most in trouble with uh, have, have, uh, are, are Caucasians. So it isn't skin color, it's, it's your genetic makeup and it can be anything. It's not as common, but it does occur and that's why we're trying to find lower doses and other ways to get around it. In some places, you can go in and test everybody and that will work, but that's a, that takes work and you gotta keep the records. We're trying to come up with something that's safer, simpler and easier, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, I've had a couple of questions around malaria becoming resistant to, to fenacrin. Uh, it's always possible, but we think it's unlikely uh, simply because we've been using primaquin for so long successfully. And what it does, because it poisons the transmission, it makes it very difficult for it to continue on into uh, uh, mosquitoes. We would never say never. We, you know, we've been around too long with drugs and, and parasites or bacteria or any of the microbes to know that they, they aren't very clever at figuring these things out. But it's a much higher bar for this drug. So we think we can manage the resistance concerns. It, again, potential is there, but with combinations, we think we can deal with it. Um, you mentioned that New Island Province, Papua New Guinea, District 9600 and RAM have submitted a Rotary Global Grant application for G6PD testing prior to treatment with Primaquin. Is Tefenaquin available in PNG? Not yet. We're working on it. But when you've got an old drug that goes on the same principle, uh, certainly this is exactly the same sort of uh, project that we'd be talking about. And so, uh, 
to be able to show that it works with the old and available drug would be extremely important in terms of eventually rolling out to Fenequin. Because the wheels of government and other things work slowly, particularly in COVID era, uh, we're not there yet with the Fenequin. But yes, G6PD is, is, is still an issue when you're talking about Primaquin. We've done that in studies in Guadalcanal, and I can tell you that, you know, the practicalities are real. This, you know, when you're dealing with real people and real health systems, it, it isn't as simple as a, as a lecturer may make it sound in his slides. Uh, so the kind of RAM project that's being discussed in New Ireland is important in terms of just showing that it's not just an idea. It's something that we could actually take to the field and do. And I hope we get that opportunity. We'll see. Um, I've got a last couple of questions. Can we look to a time when like polio and smallpox, we can eliminate malaria altogether? Or is it always going to be out there looking for a host? Well, the way I look at it is we've eliminated malaria from half the world already. Malaria used to be quite endemic in the Southern United States, Southern Europe, uh, Northern Australia. It's not there anymore. And it isn't, nobody worries about it. Um, and all right, you might say, well, that was an easier place than say Papua New Guinea, but it wasn't, it, it's not impossible. So yes, there are places such as Central Africa that have a great deal of malaria. But there are places like all of South America that have very little. We've made big progress. So can we eliminate malaria? The answer is yes, we can. Uh, what's it going to look like? Well, it's going to look a lot different than polio because they're very different microbes. They're very, you know, one's a virus and one's a parasite. But we made amazing progress against malaria. Can we eliminate the last parasite? The answer. Neither does North America. Does it take a long time? Is it going to take a lot of investment and work? Yes, it will. But is malaria elimination more than just an idea? Absolutely. It's happening right now. Uh, and the last one I have is, does the sleeping parasite exist only with certain strains of malaria? And is follow-up recommended in people who have been diagnosed? All right, falciparum malaria goes through the liver, but it doesn't hide out there. That makes it a, a bit easier, if you will. So what I've been talking about with hypnozoites or sleeping parasites is relapsing malaria, which is specifically, as Ken mentioned, Vivax and uh, ovale malaria. Now in Asia, that's near majority. And when you start controlling malaria, it, you first control falciparum malaria. That's just intrinsic. So when we get down to malaria elimination, that's what we're talking about, getting rid of the relapsing malaria. And uh, that's going to be the hard part. We already know that from other places, and, and that's why we're having to work through the different issues we already know that we have with tofenaquin, primaquin, and other such drugs. Okay, we'll need to wrap up there, and I thank you so much for your time today. Um, Dennis, and for all of your useful information that you've shared with us. All right. And I'm now going to introduce District 9810 RAM Supervisor Shelley Gurney. Shelley's a career bank officer who requalified to work in childcare. An active supporter of her husband's career, they have lived and worked across Australia and Papua New Guinea, travelled extensively, and during her husband's time as district governor, in District 9810 met Rotarians from all over the world. A keen supporter of Rotary, it was during this time that Shelley herself became a Rotarian for a cause. Ram is dear to her heart and currently is District 9810's Rotarians Against Malaria Supervisor. I will let Shelley tell you her journey in her own words with her topic of me, malaria and Rotary. Please welcome Shelley Gurney. Thank you, Nat. Um, I'm Shelley and it's my pleasure to be able to be here today and to share my story. 
My involvement with Rotary has spanned 15 years. I've met Rotaractors and Rotarians from all over the world, all corners of Australia, who we call friends, colleagues and mentors. When I heard about Rotary working towards eliminating malaria, I knew it was time for me to join Rotary so as I could lend my voice to Rotarians Against Malaria. This is our son at 10 months old when we lived and worked in Port Moresby. In this beautiful tropical climate, we were warned about malaria and medication was given us to us from the doctor in Australia. On arrival, the local doctor said not to take it because it was their first medication of choice for the treatment. And as we're going to be living in Papua New Guinea for two years, not for long-term use. We visited beaches and national parks on weekends. The local people seemed to be unconcerned. Here's Hubby with his state-of-the-art video camera at the local Sing Sing. The government sprayed areas frequently, but we could not buy a mosquito net anywhere. On a local beach, we tasted coconut milk straight from the tree. And that's me in my curly phase. Clothing's minimal in the heat, slip slop slap, plenty of skin for a mosquito to feed on. Our son and I caught malaria and there was no visible mosquito bite. We went to the doctor, because, not because I had a headache and felt hot and tired, but because our baby had a slight temperature. She looked at us and said, you both have malaria. And thankfully, the early treatment, in first world treatment in this third world country means that we don't have lasting effects and because it could be removed from our bloodstream. Rotarians about, Against Malaria implements programs to break the cycle of infection by working with government and non-government organisations, distributing long lasting insecticide bed nets, indoor residual spraying and the supply of portable rapid diagnostic test kits. Rams aiming to have a shop in each district selling affordable nets. One net covers two people. It costs one day's wage and lasts three years. The cost is $10. The effectiveness of RAM program stems from the education of the people who've lived with malaria for generations. It can be prevented and it can be treated. The outcomes of the programs are life-saving. Malaria causes anemia and low birth weight and premature birth. Less time spent bedridden with malaria is reflected by an improved economy, employment and education. When our son contracted malaria, he was a healthy 10 month old, twice the size of a local child. I'm so glad I was unaware of the high death rate of children under five years old at the time but this has inspired me to help eliminate malaria. Chasing malaria involves the active participation of communities in identifying mosquito breeding sites. We supply tools to help remove them, and their children collecting larvae to study, and perhaps releasing fish into the ponds. RAM distributes long lasting insecticide nets free to pregnant mothers and those diagnosed with malaria. These villagers are so proud to be given life-saving bed nets, they've dressed in ceremonial costume. Records are kept of all nets distributed and the location of malaria outbreaks. There are difficulties. The rough terrain where vehicles can't access means that supplies have to be carried into the villages. Baby, of course, comes too. And it's amazing how much weight they can carry on their heads. The assistance of volunteers helping make things happen cannot be underestimated. Here, Rotarians assist with the distribution of nets and record keeping in Timor-Leste. In 2019, approximately 100 countries were affected by malaria. At an event I attended that year, I was approached by a young professional who looked at my badge and said, I know about malaria. At the age of 12, my best friend had her first overseas trip to visit her dad where he was working. I only saw her for two days after her holidays. Then she was off sick, tired from her travels. Her funeral was two weeks later. She caught malaria. Malaria is deadly. 
The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does great work in the malaria elimination independent of Rotary. And I'd like to quote one of his press releases where mosquitoes kill more people in one day than sharks have killed over the last hundred years. We are proud to be working with our near neighbours in Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands and Timor-Leste. And in 2020, we are returning to Vanuatu for their End Malaria in Vanuatu Good Program, re-establishing indoor residual spraying, supplying bed nets and education. In 1990, Rotary helped to reduce malaria by 80% in Vanuatu. We're also assisting West Timor to accelerate malaria elimination in the districts on the West Timor and Timor-Leste borders. Mosquitoes don't recognise country borders and Timor-Leste is on the verge of being declared malaria-free. We do not work alone. These and many other research institutes provide the inspiration, research and funding needed to make eliminating malaria possible. We are so glad we can play our part. I joined Rotary three years ago because I wanted to be counted as a Rotarian against malaria. And on behalf of the 228 million people who contract malaria each year, I say thank you. And in the words of the locals in New Guinea, you and me will rouse some malaria. We'll eliminate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, and our last speaker for today, for today is Graham Strong. Graham is the director of a Victorian company called Aqu Aquitaine Products. He is the inventor of a unique mosquito control product, Aquitaine AMF, which many of you will be aware of from his past presentations to RAM conferences. Today, he will be giving a brief update on the product and is also showing a two minute videos, video. Please welcome Graham Strong. Thanks, Nat, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, it sounds as though you said a 10 minute video, but it's two minutes, which is a, a lot less to endure. Um, today, as Nat said, I just want to give a, uh, a brief introduction on Aquitaine AMF, the product, and then uh, mention a couple of updates as to what's happened in the last year or so, and then show this video. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a silicon-based liquid which spreads across the surface of standing water, and it forms a very thin film. Um, silicon, have, has got a very low surface tension. And that means that the mosquito larvae and pupae that breed in the water uh, can't attach at the surface to breathe, uh, so they drown. Uh, it's a simple idea, but no toxic chemicals required. Um, it's now been approved for sale in 65 countries, and many of those have exempted it from registration. Um, due to its physical action. Uh, it's also been pre-qualified by WHO, which is a huge step forward. Uh, and that means that it's been extensively assessed in terms of um, efficacy and safety and uh, quality. Um, it's the only Australian uh, vector control product to be uh, pre-qualified by WHO. Uh, it's the only vector control product globally to be pre-qualified, uh, which has a, a physical action. Um, so today I'll just give a couple of uh, updates on some variations we have. This, these are called mosquito blocks. I'm not sure how well you can see them, but they're, they're like a block of chocolate made from plaster of Paris, and they've been immersed in the AMF. Uh, the idea is that people can snap off a segment and drop it into water around their home uh, and it provides protection against mosquitoes breeding for several months as a segment breaks down and releases the AMF. And we've tried to keep it very simple um, in terms of how many of these blocks do you need for various size water bodies. Most um, domestic water only requires one block. So that's one update. And the second one 
is um, it's a product called Aquitaine Plus, uh, which is Aquitaine AMF with uh, 2% BTI. I don't know how many of you are familiar with BTI, but it's a, it's a bacterium which is um, quite widely used around the world to control mosquitoes. Um, it works very well on young larvae in the water, but not on other stages of the cycle. Um, our, our product, Aquitaine AMF, works on all stages, but it can be a bit slow on the, on the you know, young larvae. So they're very complementary to each other. You know, one plus one equals three, basically. Um, there's more information on, on our website about that. Um, that's really all I wanted to say. It wasn't supposed to be a formal presentation, but um, Natanya, if you're out there, uh, can you please run this two minute video? If it's not running, just talk amongst yourselves. Is there any sound? Any sound? Um, it's running through my laptop, but can you not hear it? I can't hear it. I don't know about other people. No, I can't hear it. Sorry about that. Can't hear. It seemed to be on fast forward. Can you hear it now? It's on fast forward instead of um, play. Uh, hang on. Sorry about this, everyone. You probably saw it's a CNN video that was was put together recently um, on a, a use of drones um, to apply Aquitaine AMF on rice paddies in Zanzibar. And it was also run by Reuters and Forbes and some other um, national or global uh, news uh, services. Maybe while I'm waiting, I'll just pad, it, pad out some time just to explain a bit about Aquitaine AMF and, and the features of it. I think one is that um, there are no special um, handling requirements. It can be just um, uh, stored in any, any situation without worrying about refrigeration or whatever, the way a lot of lava sites have to be. Uh, it's safe to use, not being toxic. Um, one of its big advantages is that it's easy to access difficult areas because you don't have to apply it where the mosquitoes are actually breeding. As long as there's a continuous uh, water surface, the product will, will cover it. Um, it uh, it uh, is on the surface there for about four weeks in, in most cases, so you get fairly long-term protection. And probably the big one is that there's no possibility of resistance unlike a lot of larvicides, um, because um, uh, it's, it's basically interfering with their, their physical means of, of living and breathing. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think that fills a nice niche, if you like, it, when compared with other larvicides, many of which um, are now being identified as being resistant. To, um, to, the, to the chemicals that are used. Uh, there was a question there, I'm not sure who it was from, about the safety aspect. Well, that was one of the angles that um, WHO looked at in order to pre-qualify it. Um, we, we had to submit a dossier of about 1,400 pages to obtain this pre-qualification. And um, 
one of the, um, the the most common questions is how safe is it? Well, silicone, which is the basis of the product, um, have been examined for decades, over 50 years. And we were able to use a lot of that material to substantiate that, that um, uh, there were no issues there with either the impact on humans or on the environment. Here we go now. about that anyway you can get the impression we can watch it on youtube ourselves yep okay i'll see what i can do with that um I'm disappointing because it's quite an impressive video when it's when it's running properly um okay right, uh, graham well, sorry I'm, to interrupt yep. um yep. i've just been talking to natalia she will put a link on the chat line so people can watch it yeah and we okay. will put the link on the youtube line as well when we compile the whole conference yeah okay i'll tick tack with natania about that yep okay right. thanks That's good um there were a couple of questions one was about the safety and as i was saying it, it's fine for humans and the environment the impact on non-target uh, uh, organisms is minimal um, it's safe for cattle or or animals, other animals to use. Um, uh, and there was also a question about, um, you know, what are the impacts if mosquitoes are killed? Does that somehow disrupt the the um, the natural order of things, where mosquitoes are part of the environment, and if you cut out one slice of it, then you can disrupt other things. Um, I guess that's right, but I, I, uh, enthusiastic as I am about the product, I don't think it's going to wipe out mosquitoes around the world. Um, uh, and also, other toxic larvicides are, you know, very uh, dangerous to other non-target organisms. So, in terms of the scale of um, toxicity, Aquitaine would be far and, and above the uh, the lowest in that level. Um, so, uh, you know, I suppose the big question is, do we want to save mosquitoes or do we want to save people from malaria? And uh, I think most people would go for the second one. I'll stop blabbing on. Okay. We <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing that, Graham. And everyone can watch um, the video that Natanya has shared in the chat. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to all of the speakers today. And we really appreciate your time attending our virtual RAM conference. Um, there will be the meeting starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow for the second part of this. And if you can all sign in about 10 minutes before as well. And thank you everyone for having me as your MC as well for today.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow morning, bright and early on a Sunday morning. Thanks, Nat, for all the technical help, and uh, thanks everybody else for being guest speaker, as, uh, as Nat said. So, see you all tomorrow morning. It's bye-bye from me, and bye-bye from him. Thank Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye.